will have joined us. Welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar, our first of 2022, so I suppose I could still say Happy New Year to everybody, um, even though it is February already. Um, yes, welcome to this webinar. Today we're going to talk about um, the, uh, the information that was presented um, at the American Society of Hematology Conference, which is held in the USA every year, and what was talked about regarding CML specifically. And um, I know that conferences can be quite, um, scientific conferences can be quite intimidating, but also full of really useful information for patients as well as hematologists. So I hope um, we'll be able to sort of demystify what goes on at such conferences and, um, and tell you a little bit about the science that went on there and what this actually means to you as a patient. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by um, Professor Steve O'Brien. Thanks for coming along, Steve. Thank you for your time. No I'm very much looking forward to, to today's discussion. So um, Steve's going to cover a number of topics, but please do feel free to sort of chip in as we go through, we're going to run a slightly different, I guess, to usual webinars um, where we'd like to talk in themes. Um, and uh, Steve's given me permission to interrupt him as he goes along. So do um, make sure you ask your questions. Um, you can do this uh, either if you're on Zoom using the chat function, uh, which is a little speech bubble probably at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on Facebook. Um, watching us on Facebook, do post it in the comments. And um, I've got colleagues that are sending them all the way over to me via the magic of the internet so we can address those wherever you're watching too. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll ask Steve to start his presentation. I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing what was said at, at Ash this year, Absolutely. last year. <laughs> yeah, last year, thanks very much. Um, hi everybody, for, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Steve O'Brien. I'm a haematologist based in Newcastle. Um, that's half my job. The, the other half of my job is uh, as a chair of a technology appraisal committee at NICE. So looking at some of the new medicines that are coming through for the NHS. And there is a new medicine coming through NICE um, in relation to CML, where there were some new data presented at ASH last year. So I'll, I'll visit that in the slides. A um, couple of things to say before I show you the detail. Firstly, um, the I, I'm going to go through some slides in PowerPoint. I'm not a fan of PowerPoint, but for this kind of thing, it's useful. Um, so these slides, Charlotte, I think, is going to make available, downloadable, whatever, distributable afterwards. Um, and there's lots of links in the slides. <clears throat> Um, which will take you to all of the stuff that was at the meeting if you want to do some more reading about it. So um, all the abstracts, the information that I'm going to show you is in the public domain. You don't have to pay a, a you know, license fee or anything to go and find it. Um, so I'll show you through that navigation. Um, and I won't cover anything, everything, of course, there's far too much to do, but you can have a fiddle around with the links, particularly afterwards. Um, and the other contents of the slides and, and um, dig into as much detail as you wish, really. The second thing is uh, to say I didn't go to the meeting. Um, it was in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, usually every December, the first weekend and every December for my whole career, really, I'd be away from home and not able to go and get the Christmas tree and then stuck in some snow ridden airport in the US and then hanging around Terminal 5. So it was actually quite a joy, a joy not to go to the conference this year, I have to say. So the stuff I'm showing you today is from the abstracts and a little bit of extra stuff that I'm aware that's been published and, uh, and going around. And I guess the third thing to say um, is I, I just I don't want to give a talk at the moment, a lecture about what's going on. So um, I want you to interrupt. Um, I'm going to pause every few slides or so and say, are there any questions? But as, as I'm going through, if you think of something, as Charlotte mentioned, just throw it in the chat um, and she and Nick will, will point that uh, out to me and we'll make sure we cover the question. So um, I'm going to stop lots during the, the stuff and I'm very keen for you to chip in, ask questions, make comments, disagree, um, violently berate me, anything you wish. So it's more of, more of an informal thing rather than a lecture. So uh, let me share my screen and um, get some 
stuff going. Charlotte, give me a thumbs up if I'm full screen. Yep, that looks great. Thanks, Steve. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, you, you can get all this stuff I'm going to show uh, yourself. It's readily available on the internet. You don't need an account, a password, a credit card, or anything like that. Um, the trouble is, and it took me quite a few years of going to this conference to work out how to do it. Um, the trouble is there's masses of stuff there. And if you don't know where to look and how to do it, it can be very overwhelming. Um, but actually, once you figure it out, it's pretty straightforward. So um, this link at the top of the page here is the link to all of the abstracts, the whole program. Let me just see if it actually, I'm not going to bother linking because it'll waste time and there's more th important things to discuss. But um, if you hit that link and it will be live in the links in the PowerPoint deck that you'll get sent through, you get this massive amount of stuff. Um, however, for CML related things, there's only two categories, really, that, that have the meat of what's there. 95% of stuff that's research in CML is in these two categories, 632 and 631. Um, most of what I'm going to show you today is clinical, because I think that's probably mostly what you're going to be interested in. I'm touching on some of the basic science, but if you do a search for category 632, um, you will see all of the stuff that came out of ASH that's of clinical interest. Um, let me just move this forward. Oops, too far. Steve, hey, may I interrupt you at that point? Sorry to interrupt you so early. I was just thinking, um, for those who may not be familiar with scientific conferences, so each abstract, does that relate to a specific research project? Can somebody have well, multiple abstracts, for let, example? Let me show you one in that case. I'm going to yeah. slightly change my screen sharing, so I'm, I'm showing my whole screen rather than PowerPoint. Bear with me one second. Yeah, I think that might actually be quite valuable for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you, Charlotte, again, just let me know. You should be seeing my desktop. Yeah. Yep, okay. See that. So let, let me um, pull up one of one of these sets of links. So this top link here is um, the one to all of the clinical abstracts. But if I go and click on this one below presentations um, and just open a browser. Again, Charlotte, just keep me on the straight and narrow. Is this displaying okay? Yeah, I can see the abstract, okay. perfect. So um, this, if I pop back to my Ash thing, this link here is the first set of six oral presentations. Um, th there's way too many abstracts. There's probably four or 5,000 abstracts submitted to the meeting. There's way too many for everyone to get an oral presentation. So probably the most important, the most impressive, the most topical things get an oral presentation. Um, and going back quite a few years when Imatinib was starting off and there was loads of excitement in CML, there was a lot more oral presentations than there are this year. So for this year, there were only two sessions with six presentations in, that's 12 talks, full stop for the clinical developments in CML, which is um, a lot less than it used to be. Um, it probably tells you that there's not a lot that's particularly new and compelling. There's other areas of hematology, which are more compelling at the moment. You might've heard of CAR T cells, for example, where it was very popular and have only developed in the last few years. Um, so if I, I follow the link for this top line here, it takes me to this website. Um, hey, could you make that full screen? I knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's the answer. Let me try. How's that? That's a bit better. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll try. I'll just make it full screen as well. Is that a bit better? Okay. Yeah, perfect. So this is one session of six talks, um, which were, some of which I'm going to um, come along. And you can see as I gently scroll through here, you know, half past 10, you have a 10 minute presentation and five minutes for questions. So there's six lots of that. So it's an hour and a half session. Um, and then everyone, everyone goes and has a cup of tea or something. Um, and you can see here the six topics. So here, here's the thing I'm gonna to refer to shortly, which is the final analysis of the pan-European STOP study. So if I click this link, 
it takes me to what's called an abstract, which is just a summary of the research. So it tells you who did it, where they're all from, and then there's a very structured and limited format to how they do it. You know, the, what's the background? Why did we do this study? How did we do it? What did we find? What's the conclusion? And sometimes a graph. So I'll show you this graph later on. But that's one abstract. Um, and it's not necessarily one research project. It might be an aspect of a research project that's early on. It might be a final report. This happens to be the final report of this big study, 800 and some 98 patients, I think. Um, so they vary from being big studies that are really important and that will change clinical practice. Um, and they're usually in a session on Sunday afternoon, which is uh, called the plenary session. And again, there's six of those. So the star turns of the whole conference um, get put in that plenary session. And they're, they're often really important things that are going to change the way we treat lymphoma or myeloma, mm -hmm. because a massive study has shown that the older treatment has now been superseded by a newer and better treatment. Um, so that's that's rare that you see, you know, headline groundbreaking studies that change practice. But there are some things like that that come up now and again but they get star turn on Sunday afternoon. But in these other sessions, there are dozens, if not maybe hundreds of little meeting rooms and halls where we go and sit in the dark in front of a screen and see this stuff come up. So this is an abstract. It may represent a tiny laboratory study. It may represent a huge clinical trial. So does that answer your question, John? Yes, perfect, yeah. thank you. Let's pop back over here. So um, I'll put my PowerPoint back on full screen. So, um, if you've got a spare hour or two and a cup of tea, you can go and um, enjoy yourself filtering through all these things. So there were 12 presentations about clinical stuff and then three lots of posters, like a big aircraft hangar hall thing with hundreds of posters and you wander around with some uh, pretzels and usually some terrible uh, weak American beer in a plastic cup. Um, and go and chat to people on their posters uh, and it's quite a social event as well so uh, that's what goes on so for the clinical stuff 12 talks a load of posters and if I go on to the basic science stuff that's um, subject number 631 um, again 12 talks and a load of posters so that's how you navigate this thing once you've sussed that out um, it actually is quite easy and, and you can filter out the CML relevant stuff fairly readily. Um, so I hope that makes sense. I just wonder if anyone's got any questions about that. Probably most people aren't that interested to go and look at all this stuff, but I thought I'd give you the structure and the tools to go and look at it if you want. None Anyone so got far. any questions? No, none so far. Okay. No. Thank you, Steve. So um, I've picked a few themes, not, I wouldn't say randomly, but things that caught my eye. And a few themes that I think you would be interested in at the moment that are um, not just of scientific interest, but really of practical interest if you are somebody with CML or have a, a loved one with CML. Um, so in no particular order, um, this one caught my eye. Uh, it happens to be, <laughs> confusingly, abstract number 631. So it's not the same 631 that I showed you a moment ago. Um, it's the abstract number, which by coincidence is exactly the same. Uh, so you can go and find this by filtering through those things that I showed you fairly readily. Most of the things I'm focusing on today were from presentations or from talks rather than posters, because because they're probably more mature, more uh, important studies. If you've not got a very good study, it gets relegated to the back corner of the hall on a little poster. Um, important things get a presentation. So um, there was this study looking at dose of disatinib. I suspect most of you on the call are probably not on disatinib. Most people with CML are still on imatinib. Um, but if you are aware of disatinib or you're on it, you're probably aware that there's a problem that occurs now and again called pleural effusion, which is a collection of water, essentially, of fluid around your lung in the cavity between your lung and your chest wall. Um, and dosatinib is a really good drug, but it does cause pleural effusions and it causes them more frequently if you are older. Um, and it can occur many, many years after you start taking the drug. So the standard dose, and, and I ran big trials of this 
uh, in the past uh, was 100 milligrams. But someone has done an analysis. Um, it's called a propensity score analysis. I won't bore you with the details of that, but it's not the same as a randomized trial where you put people into the two groups and give them different treatments. It's an attempt to model that by matching the variables in different people. So not perfect, it's a modeled solution, but there were some interesting um, outcomes from this. Um, I'm afraid I couldn't chop out just the graph here. So you can ignore the tables unless you're particularly interested. I just point out the figure at the bottom of the slide here. So um, the pink line and the pink band um, are the higher dose of, of dosatinib and the greenish colored thing is the lower dose is 50 milligrams. Um, and I found this a little bit surprising and I'm a little bit uncertain about it because if you like, these are the wrong way around. Um, you would expect the 100 milligram line maybe to be higher than the 50 milligram line because it's talking about people who survive and do fine and haven't failed on their treatment, but it's actually flipped. Um, so my conclusion from this, and I've seen it from other papers before, is probably 50 milligrams is as good as 100 milligrams. I'm not sure it's better than 100 milligrams. And if you look at some of the side effect data, um, and it's not on these tables, but the risk of pleural effusion is, is less, significantly less, if you're on 50 milligrams. So if, if you're on desatinib or um, you know, your, one of your loved ones is on desatinib, um, and they're on a full dose of 100 and they get pleural effusion, or even if they don't, you could probably get just as good a response on 50 milligrams. And there's other evidence to back that up. So that, I thought that was quite an interesting way of doing things, the propensity scoring modeling and um, produce an interesting result, which is quite reassuring and may avoid side effects in some people. Um, I, I've even got some, and I think the lowest dose I've got on for a patient on desatinib is 20 milligrams every other day. So kind of 10 milligram wow. equivalent, if you like. Mm. So you can get away with not having very much dosatinib. Um, and the same is true with some of the other medications if you have problems with side effects. You don't have to soldier on at full doses of everything if you're having problems. So the C word raises its ugly head. I just had COVID three weeks ago and it wiped me out. And I was very fed up because I've had all my jabs and I've seen loads mm. of patients with it and avoided it for two years but we're not done with the damn thing yet it seems so um steve sorry just yeah. before we move on to covid i've got a yeah, couple yeah. of comments on okay. the yeah. people saying that they they're on 20 milligrams as well and um it's made me think uh, a little bit about um we've talked about dose reduction on previous webinars in the past and right. I, i'm curious as to what you felt that study added to your practice if that makes sense in the um, if dose reduction is something that you would do in in your practice anyway, what what purpose do these propensities matching studies play? Do they give you some reassurance as a clinician? Or I think I think they reassure you on the basis of efficacy. It's very clear um, that a lower dose of desatinib causes fewer problems. But what I've I've seen in the past, particularly running the Spirit trial, Spirit Two trial, was um, a lot of clinicians would abandon the drug. Um, if 100 milligrams produced a pleural effusion um, and the patient had an excellent response, they'd say, oh, desatinib is not for you um, because you had a pleural effusion. And then maybe get switched to nilotinib, which can have side effects as well. So I think this and other studies provide some reassurance to say, well, actually maybe desatinib is for you. You just don't need as much. And if you halve the dose with this study um, and others like it, um, you get just the same benefit. Um, there's no loss of response or increased risk of dying or anything terrible. Um, and it significantly reduces the, the um, pleural effusion rate. So it's not a new observation, Charlotte, but I think it's a way of confirming and reassuring us that a lower dose is probably fine. Yeah, and I think um, one of the phrases that sticks with me is that medicine is an art sometimes as well. So it's interesting that it's the sort of thing you've been doing for a while and then then you get the science to sort of come along and tell you it was probably the right decision. I think that's a, it's just really interesting to me that sometimes that's the way it works. I hope I'm more of a scientist than an artist, but you never know. <laughs> uh, I hope that's reassuring to those who are um, 
as, as a lady saying she's going back up to 20 milligrams. So um, I hope that um, you know, that all makes sense um, for those. Who the other thing just to mention about, because uh, it seems as if there are some folk on the call who are under SATNIV, this plural effusion thing can occur years and years after starting. So um, I've just broken my previous record of about five years by finding someone who's developed plural effusion seven years after starting. So um, it's always something to be on the lookout for. Um, and if you know, if you get a bit breathless going up the stairs and it's a bit unusual, mention it and don't let doctors near your chest with needles and things like that. Tell them you're on dysatnib and uh, to ring your hematologist. But um, yeah, so I think that was all quite quite encouraging, really. Great, thank you. Um, so should we move on to the C word? Okay. So there's a few things going on with, with COVID um, and there's some new medicines coming around the track. And I think it's a little bit confusing uh, whether you as a person with CML can and should get access to these new medicines. So I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what came out of the ASH data, which was kind of interesting. I'm also going to hopefully give you a sense of what, what I think is where we're up to with COVID in CML patients. And the bottom line is, I think it's not a big problem for CML patients, but I'll, I'll justify that comment with a little bit more evidence, if I may, and then very happy to have a discussion. You might be bored stiff of talking about CML, so in that case, don't feel you have to ask some questions, but you still get lots of inquiries about it. So this abstract 634, and again, when you get hold of these slides, if you click on this link, um, I'll just see if it works. Well, it seems to work. So it'll take you straight through to the actual raw material. So if you're interested in this a bit more, um, you can go through and see the actual data and the number of patients and how they did things. Um, but this was quite an interesting study, which I think confirms some things that I think are pretty obvious. But there's one little thing which wasn't maybe as obvious, and I'm still not sure about, but here it is. So I'm afraid this graphic isn't very good. Uh, because it's not very high resolution, but I can tell you the thing to cast your eye upon and um, catch your attention there. So this, uh, this study had 606 patients. It was an international study. The first author was from Brazil, I think, if I remember rightly. Yep. But you can see there Australia, the States, um, UK, France, international study. Um, going by the, <coughs> excuse me, the name of Candid. Um, and a, a lot of their findings, I think, were pretty obvious. So we know very well that if you're older, you don't do as well with um, COVID. Uh, and that's true if you've got CML. So that's not a big surprise. Um, we also know that if you have other comorbidities by which is meant, you know, other illnesses that significantly affect your health, um, you don't do as well. And that, again, it's a bit blurry, I'm sorry, but the second the B panel on the left there tells you that story. Um, they also did, and this is a bit depressing, I think, but not surprising, the, the C panel on the bottom left shows you that if you're in a low, middle or high income country, your outcome varies a lot. Um, not so many uh, numbers from the um, low income country there, but you can see the p-values, anything that says less than 0.05 is significant or important, if you like. Um, and the difference between high and middle income countries isn't much, but the difference between low and high and middle is a lot. Um, and that may well be due to vaccination. And you all watch the news as, as I have in the last year or two about how problematic that's been. So um, none of that, I think, is terribly surprising. What's a little bit of an eye-opener to me is this top panel again it's a bit blurred i'm sorry but i can describe the story to you and hopefully the message comes across so the top panel which is d tells you um the outcome of patients depending on how they've responded with their cml and again perhaps not surprisingly to me is if you've had apbc stands for accelerated phase or blast crisis which is when your CML, and it's rare these days, thankfully, but it still happens occasionally, when your CML transforms into a much more aggressive form of leukemia, um, most of those patients, by definition, would probably be on or would have had 
strong chemotherapy. There's only 16 of them there. Um, but that probably may have, well, I don't know for sure, but I think it's likely that would have reduced their immunity uh, or their resistance to infection. But if you look at the kind of ready curve and the greeny curve there, um, that's showing a difference between people with an MMR, which is a major molecular response, which is when your PCR level, sorry, it's a bit jargony, and many of you will know this, some of you might not though. PCR is a very sensitive way of measuring the leukemia transcript, the gene associated with CML. So and a major molecular response is less than 0.1. So not a big difference there. And I think this is really the first time that observation has been made. I, if you've got a super low response and you're doing brilliantly on your drug, um, chances are you'll get away with less trouble if you get COVID than if you haven't got such a response. Um, and you'll see as I come to the NHS England criteria in a bit about access to drugs, a little bit more about this. And I, I'm, to be honest, I'm scratching my head about that one and I'm not, I'm not fantastically convinced. Uh, I'm not fantastically convinced because I don't really see it in my clinical practice. Um, but we haven't had many patients with COVID, thankfully, so hard to be sure. Also, the numbers here are relatively small. There's only 84 in that no MMR group. Um, and maybe there's other reasons, what we call confounding variables, other changes in that group of patients, uh, which mean they, you know, there's another reason for them to have a worse outcome with COVID than just the fact that they haven't got an MMR. So intriguing early observation, not sure what it means or its significance. Uh, and I think it needs confirming in other studies, but overall, my, my clinical experience, and there's other papers, again, small numbers in the last six months or so, maybe longer, um, looking at studies of CML patients, um, where it doesn't seem to be a big problem. It's very different to if you've got, say, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you've had a bone marrow transplant, you're on steroids, clearly those people are at more risk from COVID. But I, I don't sense um, from the evidence and from my own experience that COVID is a massive problem in patients with CML. Just before I perhaps pause and take some questions, um, I'm just going to point out a couple of other things that are recent and of interest. Um, there was, again, you can find this, just hit on these links and you'll get the original papers. So there was a rec very recent study of just nine patients from a hospital in the UK who got COVID uh, with CML, kind of gathering. Of, it wasn't just from one centre. I think they gathered it from a few colleagues. Um, and again, I think the recovery and the outcome was, was as you would expect from age match controls. There wasn't something terrible about having CML that led to your demise with COVID. And then very interesting again, because we're dealing now with this variant or variants, you know, Omicron, we've got B1 and now Omicron B2, where we just don't know, well, there's three key things I think we don't really know. We don't know if it's genuinely less severe. It seems to be, number one. Number two, we don't really know whether two or three shots of the vaccines have made a big difference and have worked against this. Having probably just had it recently, I'm not convinced, but that's N equals one. And thirdly, the drugs I'm going to mention in a moment um, for COVID uh, are have been trialed really before Omicron appeared on the scene. And certainly some of the neutral, uh, neutralizing antibodies, you remember Donald Trump getting Regeneron. Um, that stuff just doesn't work. This cocktail of two neutral anti antibodies doesn't work at all against Omicron. So, you know, this landscape's constantly changing uh, and it's difficult to know what it means. But um, this study that's in the Lancet, um, quite a few patients, uh, hundreds of patients, none of whom had COVID, uh, had CML, I'd, I'd emphasize, but it's, it's an interesting observation. They look for antibodies, you know, have these vaccines worked in patients with cancer? And again, you can go and look at this paper uh, yourself. It's uh, available with somebody on the internet, no firewall, no paywall. Um, and it's saying that two shots in patients with Omicron, uh, who got Omicron, doesn't seem to have done much good. Three shots maybe does help, but it's not great, not perfect. Um, and for those with hematological disorders, 
but again, not CML. There seem to be more of a problem than those with solid tumors. So constantly evolving evidence here. Um, and we don't really know what it means for CML patients. But again, I'm not seeing any red flags that have come from stuff I've seen published from conversations with colleagues from my own clinical experience, or indeed from what was new at ASH, that would suggest that COVID is a particular problem with CML. So I think you can be fairly reassured by that. Um, Charlotte, I might just pause and see if anyone's got any questions there, because I'm going to move on to these new drugs for COVID and who should get them and how we get them and all that kind of stuff. So any, yeah. any questions at this point? Um, I just wondered briefly if we may summarise that your feelings. Is it, am I right in thinking you are feeling that there's no overriding evidence that CML patients are any worse off unless, except for those in blast phase? Is that have I sort of fairly interpreted yeah, what you said I, there? I think, I think that's a fair summary. Um, <clears throat> and the only new little thing that's on my radar screen from, from the ASH data is this thing about whether or not you've had a major molecular response. Mm. Um, you, I'm just about to show you the criteria in a moment. And I think that's partly been informed yeah. um, by that observation. But it, it's a, a pretty weak observation, I think, at the moment. Um, I don't think it's a terribly great discriminator, but yeah. what you've just said, I think is correct, Charlotte. I, I think for the vast majority of people with CML, um, COVID isn't going to be very pleasant if you get it, but I don't think you're more likely to have serious consequences or die from it than your next door neighbor who's your same age, fitness, whatever else. Yeah, absolutely. But someone has asked, um, and if you don't know the answer, that's absolutely fine, but if whether a type of TKI make make a difference so they've asked specifically in relation to whether certain drugs um will be more immunosuppressing so worse the immune system but um i wondered if you had any thoughts on that and maybe how that translates to a response to covid at all so so two bits to that or two questions there i think i'll, I'll answer one and then i'll move on to the next couple of slides and show you the 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 drugs um the antiviral drugs so um are you likely to get worse problems if you've got CML with COVID on drug A versus drug B? Um, answer, no evidence for that. Um, very difficult to actually prove that because um, of the drugs that are around for CML, still the vast majority of people in the world who've got CML are on imatinib. Um, so the numbers are always going to be small. It's always going to be difficult to show a particular class effect of a drug. So it doesn't mean it can't be true, but um, there's no there's no evidence at the moment at all, and I'm not sure there ever will be. Mm. If, if you're on, you know, imatinib, you should go on to disatinib because imatinib is super risky for COVID, and disatinib isn't, for example. Um, so not sure, but don't think so is the answer. Great. And in terms of the um, the drugs and interactions and you know immunosuppressions, and let me. Press on a little bit, Charlotte, if I may, and then we can pause again. And, and um... just before you do, if I may, Steve, oh, there's ahead. one more question on yeah. risk, and I thought that sort of fitted in nicely. Someone's asked if um, your risk is likely to be different if you're in the early stages of treatment or been recently diagnosed, which I, I think you uh, somewhat answered in in your initial presentation around blast phase potentially, but I, I didn't know whether you had any other thoughts on that. Let Let me move it on um, yeah. because. I'll come back to that question specifically yeah. because I think it's it's a tricky one. Uh, so my, my my view on it is no, I don't think there's much more risk if you just started treatment yesterday mm -hmm. than if you are six months down the track or a year down the track or six years down the track. I don't think there's a great, there's no evidence there's a difference in risk there. But if you remember what I just showed you of the, you know, have you got a major molecular response or have you not? By definition, before you start treatment, or if you've had it a week, you're not going to be responding very well because you've only just started. Um, but you may well and are likely to get a major molecular response in a few months or a year or two. So, you know, how robust is that? But but let me press on and show you these criteria and see if that makes any more sense. Absolutely. So um, there's some new drugs around for treating COVID. Um, there are nine, in fact, in total. Uh, potentially being considered um, and there is a nice multi-technology appraisal likely to proceed 
to look at all of these things because of course we're bringing them all in pretty swiftly not all of them but um they're all coming along quite quickly and we're still in something of a crisis and i think the health service quite rightly is picking these things up quite quickly um probably quicker than many other countries in the world actually um but it's there's lots of uncertainty around them so I think the key uncertainty is that most, if not all of them, were trialled last year before Omicron, before you even had the word Omicron. I think that was only invented in December. So you can be pretty sure that maybe nobody who had these medicines had Omicron. And I've always already mentioned the Regeneron uh, neutralising antibody combination. That just does not work against Omicron at all. Uh, whereas some of them, uh, other ones do. Um, and some of the antivirals do as well. So these are the three medicines that are about to appear. If I pop back one slide, this, this is the current clinical commissioning policy, um, which was uh, published on Christmas Eve. Uh, and it contains two medicines at the mo moment. One's called Molnupiravir, and the second one is called Citrovimab. And I believe on Thursday of this week, this guidance is uh, likely to be updated to include a third medicine, uh, which is on the next slide. So these three drugs are the things that are coming into the NHS. Um, so molnupiravir and citrovimab are available right now. And I've spent many hours on the phone now since January fielding calls. Um, and it's an automatic mechanism. If you get a PCR positive test and you are known to NHS England and we can talk about Scotland um, as well or other devolved nations but I'm particularly talking about NHS England at the moment um, so if you test PCR positive and you're on the NHSE database as being highly clinically vulnerable then um, you are automatically fed through to one of I think it's 22 COVID uh, administration centres Newcastle happens to be one and you appear on a list where a pile of doctors um, who are often giving up their weekends are, will ring you and say, how are you? Um, and if you say, well, I'm getting a bit worse and I've got, you know, X, Y, Z condition, there's a big list of them. Um, you might be advised to either go to the hospital and have an infusion or you'll get sent a packet of pills. So number one and three here are pills. Whoops. Um, so molnupiravir and Paxlovid, which is the trade name for two drugs in combination, as you can see on the screen there, Nermotrelvir and Ritonavir, they're pills, and you'd get sent um, usually within 12, 24 hours a packet of pills. Um, so Trovimab is an infusion. Um, possibly the most effective of these three. Um, I think Paxlovid and Citrovimab are probably better than Molnupiravir in terms of efficacy. Um, and the trouble with Citrovimab is it's you have to sit in a chair in a hospital and there's not enough slots for everyone to come and sit in the chair in the hospital because um, everywhere's busy. So um, probably most patients who are get, going to get offered something will get offered Paxlovid and probably the most effective. The trouble with Paxlovid is it's messy in terms of interaction with other drugs. Um, it's likely knowing its mechanism of action that it would interact with your TKI, for example, if you were to take it. But I'm going to come on in a moment and describe the criteria from NHS England um, as to whether people with CML should have it. So again, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, I've thrown a lot at you at the moment. So with regard to the quest the, the drugs are available, the three here, anyone got any questions about those? And then I'll tell you about CML and these drugs. Um no, we've had quite a few questions about vaccines, but keen not to change the subject too early. Maybe we could come back to that very briefly. But no, all the questions are about eligibility, so it'd be great if we could cover so that. Let's next. do eligibility. So this document, which uh, was published just before Christmas, um, again, publicly available. If you, There's no point searching now because it's not out. But if you search at the weekend and just look for you know, NHS England in commissioning policy, antivirals, you'll find it quite easily. Um, if you're struggling, Charlotte, and you want to bug me next week, I can send you the link if people are interested. But this is what the current policy says. Um, so there's, I won't go through all the, the, there's a big list of people who should get these drugs. 
Um, and in the hematological malignancies section, it says this. So it basically says anyone who's had some chemo within the last 12 months, except people with chronic phase, CML, in molecular response, um, point one, point two, uh, first or second line tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So to exaggerate, to, to clarify, if you were, if you'd had imatinib and nilotinib and it hadn't worked for you, and now you were on panatinib and your blood count was not normal, i.e. you weren't responding, you would clearly qualify. Um, to come back to the, the sort of point you mentioned earlier, Charlotte, if, if you were diagnosed with CML a month ago and you were on imatinib, um, and you were getting a response, but had, didn't have a major molecular response. Um, I think it's a bit unclear whether you should get this because it doesn't say major molecular response, it says molecular response. Um, and again, I, I've fed back about the potential ambiguity about that because is a molecular response like a tiny little bit of a response or is it a huge response or no detectable disease? Not very clear. Um, so I think we're, we're going, we have had to deal with this and we are going to have to deal with it. And maybe the wording is going to get tightened up. Um, but if you are, and it, it's also seeming to say, if you're on first line of matinib, for example, i.e. the second of those criteria rather than the first is applying, you don't need this stuff anyway. So uh, this, this changed. Uh, and the reason there was the revision on the 24th of December was because the original version didn't have this in it. Um, and it got updated um, and clarified to some extent. So what question, what do I make of all this? And if you rang me um, tomorrow saying I've got COVID, PCL positive, I'm getting worse, should I have some of this stuff? Um, I think I'd say, um, and I've not mentioned age at all here, that there's no, it's not like if you're over 50, you automatically get it. Although there's a, a big study going on at the moment with, in, in the end, 10,000 patients in called Panoramic, which will look at the use of giving these medicines to just old people like me, who was 58 and had COVID and was in bed for three days, feeling sorry for myself. Um, but there's no age criteria alone here. You have to meet one of these things. Um, so if you were, I don't know, if you were 58 um, and you were on second line treatment and didn't have a great molecular response, um, I would probably say you should maybe have some of this stuff and then we can decide which drug to give um, because there's a little bit of evidence and I've just shown it to you and there's other similar things coming through that suggests if you haven't got a major molecular response, maybe the risk is slightly higher for you. Um, so it, it's a bit tricky, but for most people with CML, you wouldn't be eligible. And to reassure you, I don't think you'd really need it. Um, for all the reasons I've said before, I don't think we're seeing hugely excessive mortality in people with CML. So before I take any questions, what, what's, let me ask, um, or let me put another point for discussion. Um, is there a downside to having this stuff? You know, molnupiravir, um, not a great drug. There's a, there's a bit of concern about its mechanism of action a little bit. It, it interferes with a, a thing in viruses called RNA polymerase which keeps control of your genes and gene expression. So there's a, you know, if you search on the internet, you'll find someone saying, oh, could it cause mutations? And could that be a problem? Uh, unlikely, not come out in the data, but it's early. Um, so Trovimab is just practically very difficult to get hold of, but it's a one-off infusion with probably not much side effects, although you can have a reaction to it. And then Paxlovid is, um, it's a five-day course, but it's likely to interact with your uh, TKI but for five days, it probably doesn't matter. You might be advised to stop taking the TKI for five days when you're on the Paxlovid. Would that cause a problem? Not sure. Um, probably not though. So it, it's a tricky one, which requires a bit of judgment, a bit of discussion between doc and patient, um, and a fairly fine balance between risk and benefit. <coughs> My dog is saying hello. Um, but I think overall, because I'm not too worried about people with CML coming to grief with COVID, 
I would be a little on the hesitant side about rushing in to grab one of these treatments. So quite a lot in all of that, and I'm very happy to take any questions or discuss that, Charlotte. So let's pause there. Thank you, Steve. It's nice to see how, um, I guess, the information on vaccine response has fed into some of this, even if there's still some, some teething issues. Um, someone has asked about whether there would be any risks or downsides, um, which I thought was a really interesting point, but um, you've just covered that, which is really, really helpful. Um, I guess the other, the other question someone asked was about Scotland. Um, would you mind going back to the clinical commissioning policy slide? Yeah. Uh, so I think it highlights it quite nicely. Um, so you'll see the, the logos of all the, uh, the governments, oh. the, all the nations of the UK there. So um, in theory, these treatments should be available in all of the nations. Um, we have a good understanding of what's happened in England in terms of actual delivery of that in hospitals. Um, however, um, unfortunately, I'm not 100% sure how fast it's happening in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland um, is the, sort of the easiest way to, to describe it. Um, all of the government websites have information on who should be eligible and what to do if, if you test positive. So there is a process in place. Um, but the important thing to remember from all of that is that the eligibility for treatment is the same across all the nations. So everything we have here on, on, our, on our own website, which is based on this policy, um, applies to all nations. Um, it may be delivered slightly different in each country. And if you're having trouble understanding what's going on, please let us know so we can sort of interpret it for you. Um, but yes, the important thing to remember is it, that it should be available everywhere and it's been commissioned as a four nations thing to ensure that it's available to all the highest risk patients so hopefully that answers the question from the person in scotland and i think the reality charlotte if i can mm. uh, just jump in it, it's just down to logistics of getting yeah. the drug into the country into trucks into the pharmacy you know it's all the stuff same stuff we're familiar with with jabs and what have you everyone's trying to move very quickly um, but it just takes a little while for this to filter through. So even when the guidance is published, um, they won't be online instantly. But but I think it's happened pretty quickly, actually. And yeah. um, I've been fairly impressed with how the NHS has managed to deliver it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Charlotte, um, can I pick up on a couple of comments? I, I'm just seeing yeah. things caught my eye here. Someone's asked, what does Steve mean when he says first line of Mapnib? And the same person has, has, has said, what does Steve mean about molnupiravir not being a great drug? So um, first line imatinib, I just mean um, you got imatinib as the first treatment for your CML. And it's the only treatment you've ever had. So that's what I mean. And second and third line means, you know, if it's second line nilotinib, for example, you tried imatinib, it wasn't working for you. So you went on to second line treatment, which would be in that example, nilotinib. So what do I mean by molnupirinum being not a very good drug? Um, I, I'm very evidence driven. I guess I have to be working with NICE, et cetera. So um, I'm usually to the annoyance of my family. They're, I'm always saying, where's the evidence for this, that, and the other? The example being the spoon in the Prosecco bottle at the weekend. But if you do that, dangle a spoon in the bottle, it stops it from going flat. Really? Where's the evidence for that? Anyway, I, of course, it's great annoyance in my family, but I'm always looking for evidence. And when I look at the evidence for molnupiravir versus Paxlovid, for example, I think it's better for Paxlovid. There's a, there's a figure, um, a metric called the number needed to treat, uh, which is a, a quite useful way, I think, of working out how good something is. So for molnupiravir, in order to avoid one hospitalization, you have to treat 34 people. And um, with Paxlovid, it's fewer than that. Um, the trouble with Paxlovid is it interacts with things um, and it's a bit messy. But in terms of efficacy, if I was to take one or the other, I'd take Paxlovid, I think. Um, so we're just all struggling with that at the moment. Molnupiravir is the easiest to dish out because it's a packet of pills in the post with a courier and fewer interactions, but maybe not as effective. So I don't think it's rubbish, but I don't think it's as good. Um, and it was also trialed in pre-Omicron uh, era 
So who knows whether it's working against Omicron? It probably will, because it's not reliant like the antibodies are on a certain configuration of your spike protein, et cetera. It works in a different way. So I'm not saying it's completely rubbish. Uh, I just don't think it's probably as good as, as Paxilid. Great, thank you for explaining that. I think uh, somebody did ask on the eligibility criteria. Uh -huh. um, we talked about losing molecular response and how you'd consider someone eligible um, if they were not in MMR. Someone's actually posed a very interesting scenario where they've technically lost MMR because they've um, that they've come out of treatment-free remission or TFR. Is that the, the same principle for you, or would you consider that a slightly different group? What well, a good question. Um, I, so <laughs> I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. I, I think, well, the analysis that I showed you before, uh, and I was emphasizing that it was, you know, a little bit thin, but that analysis was based on achieving a certain response at a certain time, not having stopped, you know, had that level go up again and end up in a position um, because you stopped treatment. I, I, and I think personally, but I can't back this up with data. But my my judgment is that's probably a different scenario because the reason you were able to stop was because you had fantastically responding disease and were in good shape and therefore stopping was a reasonable thing to do. And that's probably different, but I don't know for sure. It's probably different to someone who is struggling to get that good response in the first place and has to try one or two or three lines of treatment. But um, it's an evidence-free zone, I'm afraid, Charlotte, but that's my... That's my best guess. Great, thank you. Just before we move on, I just wanted to say that if you aren't sure whether you're eligible, there's no harm in calling either your GP or 111 if you were to test positive and explore it as an option. Um, that's who makes the referral. Some some people get an automatic referral if they know you to be eligible. There's no harm in, in raising it if you are concerned should you test positive and just um, speak to a healthcare professional. I would, uh, that's what I would um, recommend. But I think just to add a little, I think you're right there. I've, I've been pleasantly surprised how effective the sort of pickup systems have been. I, I thought, mm, right, that's not going to work. But it has actually. Um, and I think to get into that system, if you've got concerns, probably better to ring 111 to start with and have a chat with NHS Central as it were but of course if you're still struggling you know ring up your your centre your nurse specialist your doc whatever and inquire further if need be but um, the systems have worked fairly well even under pressure. Yeah I, I'd agree absolutely. Um, I think that's everything related to Covid and obviously. Okay that's uh, probably <laughs> enough we move yeah. on. <laughs> Let's go back to Ash shall we. Okay so um, Stopping treatment is is always something that, well, I was going to say, it's always something that people want to do. It's not always something that people want to do. I had this conversation in clinic last week with somebody um, who was a bit taken aback by me suggesting that they might be able to stop. Um, and actually started crying. And I thought, oh dear, what have I done to upset you? And and she said, well, I'm, I'm crying with a bit of happiness because I didn't think I'd ever get rid of this disease and this treatment and you're now suggesting that maybe I will so I didn't expect that um so she forgave me and and stopped crying so that was a nice cry as it were um but there's lots of interest in this not everybody is bothered about stopping if you've got no side effects and you've got a great response then just take it for the rest of your life but there have been big pushes over the last 10 years really now to look at whether you can stop and probably the biggest trial internationally um was or is the Euro ski study. So I've just got three quick abstracts here. They, these numbers again in brackets refer to the abstracts. And whenever there's a blue thing, when you get the PowerPoint, you can click on that and it will take you to the abstract. So um, again, I've taken these figures from the website. So uh, this is a pretty rubbish graphic, but you, I can tell you the story. Um, so the, the red line is molecular uh, remission uh, sorry, molecular relapse-free survival, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, MRCFS, I think they called it. Um, and you can, and the blue line is without any treatment at all, and they're pretty much superimposed. And if you look at the halfway mark, um, where there's a big blob of red and a big blob of uh, blue, uh, you can see that 
by 30 months at the bottom there. So that's two and a half years in. Um, you can be pretty sure if you, well, A, it's about 50% of people stay off drug when they stop in this situation. B, if you're going to have your CML come back a bit, and that doesn't mean it's a disaster, it just means that the PCR goes to be a bit positive and you might have to go back on some treatment. If you get to two and a half years, i.e. this 30 month mark where all this red and blue congregates, you're probably going to be fine. Certainly 36 months, which is the last mark just above where it says CI or um, yeah, 44 there. If you get to three years and haven't had any molecular remission, you're probably in the clear, um, by which I mean your CML has gone and you're done. You don't need any more treatment. So that's quite encouraging. But of course, it's only a minority of people who get to be completely PCR negative. So this isn't particularly new. Um, but it's a reassurance uh, of data we've seen before at an early stage. And I think it's the last word from this study. It's the final report. And I, I think personally, importantly here is that nobody died as a result of this intervention. Nobody went into blast crisis, i.e. completely lost control of the disease. Um, and out of, I think this is 800 patients or something, nobody died as a result of trying to do this. So I think it's a pretty reasonable, safe thing to do. Um, half of the people who stop do fine and can stay stopped. And if your disease is going to come back, it probably will have done so two and a half to three years out. So that's that's the first of my stopping abstracts. This second was, um, I'm, I'm not going to show you the abstract, but this one's 635. There was a, uh, well, there is a study called NST Path. Um, which was run by Novartis, and if, if I'm being a bit sceptical, it was to try and make everyone use nilotinib more, but um, perhaps I'm too sceptical. Um, and this was saying if you had you know, a year or two more nilotinib versus a year or two only of nilotinib, it didn't increase your chance of stopping. So whatever, I'm not that impressed with, with that. Um, but, you know, it seems to be a handy way to be able to try and stop. Um, one thing that caught my eye was this 25521, which uh, is summarized from this figure here. Um, I'm not sure what to make of this, really, because the difference here is quite striking. And the story is that if you are on nilotinib, which is the purple line at the top, um, if you are, have been on that medicine and try and stop versus having been on desatinib and try and stop, then you're more likely to successfully stop if you'd had nilotinib and nisatinib. And I, I'm not sure what to make of that. I, I'm always a bit skeptical about small numbers and you'll see there's only 25 people on nisatinib there. So if it was 250 people, I'd be a bit more convinced, but it isn't. So I think you have to be very wary. Um, there's a metric called a hazard ratio, which kind of informs that a little bit more. And we haven't got one on this slide. Maybe the hazard ratio is convincing, but I'm not seeing that. Um, and two of the final points are biologically, I'm not sure I understand why that would be different like this, because the first line studies of these drugs gave very similar molecular responses. So why would be one worse than the other? I don't know. Um, and finally, there have been other previous studies um, which have shown no difference in the success of stopping between these two. But so there it is. Take it or leave it. A small study, um, intriguing result and um, a conclusion that maybe if you want to stop, you're going to have more chance of succeeding and getting to that point with nilotinib than with dysapnea. But then you've got side effects to contend with. You know, there's some cardiovascular risk with nilotinib, not so with dysapnea, it would seem. And conversely, there's pleural effusion risk with dysapnea, but not with nilotinib. So um, I, taking with a pinch of salt, I think, but an interesting observation. So I'm going to pause again there, Charlotte, and see if there's any other questions. Absolutely. Um, someone has just asked if there's been any stopping trials for the pseudonym as well. I think the, 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 more, the more we talk about TFR, the more times people want to know if, if it applies to them, I suppose. Um, has there been any interest in that at all? I don't think so. Um, I didn't see anything in the abstracts. I may have missed it as a poster. But there's not not been any um, mainline you know, headline publication. The reason is because not many people are on basutinib, 
um, you know, there are increasing numbers, I guess, as time goes by, but compared to imatinib, um, and I, I didn't perhaps make it clear enough, the Euroski study, 898 patients, all imatinib, uh, only imatinib. Um, so for basutinib, um, just not enough patients around. And I don't think, but I, I stand to be corrected, I don't think there's a publication about stopping basutinib. Thank you. Someone's asked about imatinib, but I think you've clarified that the, the first study was uh, regarding imatinib, so hopefully that helps um, that person. Was there anything regarding um, TFR for the second time? This is something that's um, I, I'm seeing an increasing number of questions about myself and when talking to patients is trying TFR for a second time. Is that something the clinical community are investigating or is it quite a new concept overall? No, it's not that new and, and yes, the the researchers are investigating that it's again there's not as much this year at ash as there has been in previous years um many of the you know it didn't work let's try again studies suggested you swapped you know if you're on a matinib tried stopping it didn't work forget that go back on nilotinib um and not surprisingly there was a slightly greater success rate with stopping the second time if you'd switch tkis but, but I think, the, again, the numbers are so small there, it's really hard to be conclusive about it. But, you know, for the individual on this call who may have tried and failed to stop imatinib, I think you've got to finally balance the risk and benefit. Uh, again, I keep referring to my age, but I'm at the age where you've got to refine these things fairly carefully. So at 58, if I'd been on imatinib and failed to successfully stop I think my choices would be go back on imatinib, maybe at a reduced dose, or switch to nilotinib, for example. Um, and my dad had diabetes. Maybe I'll get blood pressure trouble one day, and nilotinib carries a cardiovascular risk. So if I was 38, fine. But if I'm 58 or 68, and weighing up the benefit of being able to stop on nilotinib versus the risk of side effects potentially when I'm on a drug that's perfectly fine and will probably see me through to my dying day when I die of something else, I'd probably just keep taking the pills that are less risky than switching. So it's it's a finely balanced judgment call of risk and benefit in that scenario. Um, and you know you don't have to successfully be get a treatment for your remission to live a normal life. You can live a full and um, completely long life being on a little bit of some treatment or even the standard dose. It's not necessary to have to stop treatment, but it's a very nice thing if you can stop it and not think about it in the morning when you wake up because you're not on any pills. So fine balance of risk and benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I can't see any other questions specifically related to treatment free remission or stopping. Okay. Um, so I can we soldier on. Yeah, keen to hear more about Siminib. Siminib, okay. Um, what do I make of a Siminib? I, I'm mixed feelings about it, really. I think it's useful to have a choice. Um, you'll remember historically we had, we have, or had, have really five drugs for CML. Imatinib, pretty amazing development in cancer treatment, but now twenty plus years old. Um, we've got nilotinib, we've got desatinib, we've got basutinib, and then we've got panatinib. So panatinib looked like the best thing since sliced bread when it first came out. Amazing responses. But then the clouds gathered, unfortunately, around it, and particularly the cloud of cardiovascular risk. So there seemed to be a higher rate of people having strokes and blocking the arteries in their legs. Um, and having heart attacks and things like that. So it kind of fell out of favour. And we only really use it in the clinic now when the chips are down. You know, if you've got really difficult CML, unfortunately, that's pretty rare these days. I can only think of two people in my clinic who are on panatinib at the moment. Um, uh, and it's because nothing else worked and they were in trouble. So we, we use it as a maybe as a drug of last resort. So there was a, a need... I think for something to come and fill that gap that um, panatinib was filling um, without maybe the risk. So that's kind of where a siminib came along. So there was an update. I think I've got the figure here. Have I got the figure? 
Yes, I have. Um, there was an update on the so-called assemble study, uh, which is the, the kind of pivotal, as they call it, phase three. And by phase three, I mean a study that compares established treatment with new treatment, and usually randomized. So you don't know which you're going to get. Um, so this is the key trial that supports the use of this drug. So 157 people were given a simonib and 76, so half that number approximately, were given basutinib. Now there's a, there's a couple of problems about this. Um, the f and, and it's in third line treatment. So, you, you know, I mentioned about lines before. So these are people who maybe have had imatinib, they then tried dilotinib, that didn't work. Um, and then perhaps needed a third drug. Now, basutinib in third line doesn't work that well. You know, it, it, it's so I, I often use it for people who are having side effects rather than resistant disease. Um, so to, to use basutinib as the comparator here is, is stacking the deck a little bit, because if you want to make your new drug look good, you choose a comparator that isn't very good. Um, so there's a bit of that going on here, I think, although the company wouldn't declare that and some people would challenge me on that, but that's my opinion. Um, and then the other problem here is because um, this T315i mutation, which is not a good thing to have, it doesn't respond to basutinib. It wasn't felt fair in a randomized trial to include people who had T315i. Um, and we can talk about what that means if people have never heard of it. But it's a mutation that you can get, which makes you respond less well to certain drugs. So um, panatinib works against this. Asimonib actually works against this. But because of the reason I mentioned, if you went in a trial and got basutinib, it, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be very ethical because it's not effective. Patients with that mutation were excluded, which is why you'll see in the criteria in a, in a moment I mentioned that it's also excluded. So um, what did it show? Um, Again, you can, you can digest these tables and this figure when you get the PowerPoint through, if you wish, if you're really bored, um, you can go and see what O'Brien's put together. But look at the figure in the middle there. So this is probability of MMR, which is major molecular response. Um, and you can see the top line, the thick solid line is the new drug as a simonib and the dotted line is basutinib. Um, and to cut a long story short, it improves your molecular response in this situation. What's, what's not on here, um, and irks me slightly, because I um, am a very stringent, as I mentioned, reviewer of data and evidence, is if you looked at the survival curves, you know, very crude, how many people died in this arm versus how many people died in that arm, there's no difference whatsoever. So um, it looks as if you can salvage a situation here in third line, but it doesn't improve your survival. And compared to other drugs, particularly compared to panatinib, um, we don't really know where we stand with this because there aren't T3 on five patients in the cohorts. Um, and we, we don't know, we haven't got a direct head-to-head -head comparison with panatinib, which would be useful. But on the, on the plus side here, in terms of side effects, which is why panatinib got bad press. It looks like asimonib has not got the same problems. So that's a real plus. Um, and I guess if I could wave a magic wand, I'd like to see the efficacy data, maybe head to head with panatinib and also including T315i patients. And I think that will be dug over in great detail when we come to look at the nice appraisal of this in due course. So promising, good to have a choice. Um, not completely convinced about where it should sit, how good it is, I think, from these, these data. But it's, it's coming to a hospital near you fairly soon um, because of this thing called the EAMS or EAMS, which is the Early Access to Medicine Scheme, which was originally a Europe-wide thing, but we've, we've kind of kept hold of that post-Brexit. Um, and as a result, this medicine went through that system and was given the green light on the 19th of January, just a couple of weeks ago. So every hospital in the country has had a bunch of papers saying um, this medicine isn't nice approved yet, but you can get access to it whilst it is being nice approved or nice considered. Um, and if you need it, you can get it. Um, and I'll show you the indication in a moment. 
The NICE process is ongoing. It's actually coming to my committee at NICE, but for fairly obvious reasons, i.e. CML is my thing, I have stepped back from it. So I won't be chairing or leading this appraisal. One of my non-CML colleagues will be. Um, and it could be that the final decision on that is, is out in the autumn. Um, I think the process is starting in May or the first meeting is so. Um, you can you don't have to wait for that at the moment. You can get it, um, and it, it could be officially commissioned fully in the NHS. Depending on how these things go, it might not succeed, but it, it may do um, at the back end of the year. And this is the indication. Whoops, let me go back a bit. Um, so it says it's for. Adult patients with Philadelphia chromosome positive CML in chronic phase without a T315I mutation for the reasons I've just mentioned, who've had two or more tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So you have to have had two. Um, so this is third line to use that nomenclature that we covered before. Um, and if you've got the 315I mutation, you shouldn't get this drug. That might work in that situation, but there's no evidence for that. So if you've got a mutation, that mutation, you probably end up on panatinib. So this is, I think, quite a, use, a useful but slightly frustrating development in that if a simonib indeed does not have the sort of side effects that panatinib does, and it works great in third line, and it works against T315I, um, that's a real blessing and a real useful thing to have. Um, but it's not clear, particularly for the 315i group, whether it would do the job properly. And it's a bit frustrating that we couldn't use that because that's where it really when the chips are down um, and the patient I or one of the patients I've got on ponatinib, for example, with the T315i mutation has had a, a little mini stroke recently. You know, maybe that's due to the drug. So I'd really like that person to go on a simonib, but they can't because they haven't got, sorry, because yes, they've got a T315I and it's excluded here. So um, I hope that makes sense, but kind of good news, I think. So interesting data, supports the use of the drug. You will be able to get it if you need it pretty soon. Um, and it may be fully commissioned in the NHS towards the end of the year, but that's pending a nice approval. So again, Charlotte, I'm gonna pause there happy to talk about a simonib and the process etc and then i've just got i think one more slide after that which will take us up to five o'clock so we're doing okay for time i think yes not too bad uh, there's been a lot of interest in a simonib um i guess most of the questions really relate to um if it's being explored in other areas so you've talked about how it, it the assembled trial in the specific group in, in terms of on the third treatment already and then obviously the exclusion of T315I so far someone's mm -hmm. asked for example about comparison with nilotinib and what, what do you know about where a simonib's being explored next? I, I guess the company would would like it possibly to be first line um that's going to be really difficult for, for two key reasons, really. One is imatinib works really well for most people. Um, so, you know, why would you wish to replace it with this medicine, which is young and relatively untested and may have long-term side effects, although it doesn't seem to at the moment. And secondly is money. Um, imatinib went off patent a few years ago, um, and it's a few hundred quid a year now. Um, I don't know what price we're going to be looking at for a simonib, but it won't be a few hundred quid a year. It'll be tens of thousands a year, probably. So in, in terms of a medicine that I imagine, which is very effective and very cost effective now, it'll be a real struggle. And I'd be very surprised if we ever see a simonib being used first line is the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is, um, and someone asked about, you know, a direct comparison with nilotinib. There isn't one. And I, that's a shame. I think there, there should be one. Uh, and again, if I'm being a bit skeptical, um, I might argue that the, the company have stacked the deck by comparing it to basutinib, which is possibly not as potent as, as nilotinib or dastatinib, for example. Um, but I'm not aware in second line treatment, for example, that there's a, an ongoing trial. There, there may be, and I'm not privy to that, but that could be pretty handy um, because at the moment we're still paying 
um, you know, regular prices because they haven't got a patent for nilotinib and dasatinib. So it could be a facimonib works as good as one of those, or possibly better. And you also catch the T315Is, perhaps even before they emerge, and it doesn't have the side effects of others. That would be really handy. And it might replace nilotinib and dasatinib. But um, I'm not aware that there's a phase three trial in second line with those two comparators. Um, it's certainly not published. I don't know if it's being cooked up or is ongoing. I don't think it is. Great, thank you. Um, someone has asked if you could elaborate a little on why bosutinib isn't very good um, in context of it not being a fair comparison with the simonib. But I think they've <laughs> quoted you word for word there. I'm not quite sure what they mean. I don't know whether you I, I, so understand. Can I tell you that there are trials which show that bosutinib compared to say dasatinib and lotinib is not as good. No, I can't. The reason is the companies would never and will never do those trials in case they look bad. Um, it's just my, I guess my clinical experience, which uh, you should take with a little bit of a pinch of salt because it's not robust data. And um, you've heard me go on about robust data quite a lot. Um, but I, I just don't have a sense that um, basutinib is as potent. It works great for people when it works. Um, and there's no need if you're on basutinib and you're on this call to think, oh dear, that's not very good. I better jump ship and get one of these other drugs. Um, it works very well for people um, who switch to it predominantly for reasons of intolerance. So I, I commonly use it in the clinic when people have lots of side effects from other drugs, but are responding very well. And in that situation, I think it works fine. Um, so there's a difference between switching to a new drug because you can't tolerate the previous one and switching to a new drug because the previous one wasn't working very well and wasn't producing a good response. So I think if you switch to bisidinib for intolerance, fine, It'll, it's a perfectly good drug. Um, but I'm not as convinced it's as potent as the others if you've switched because of a poor response, if, if that makes sense. But Again, compared to some things I've said today and showed you, I would take that with a bit of a pinch of salt because it's not as robust as some of the evidence-based things. Great, thank you. And the person's confirmed that, um, that you've explained what they wanted to know, which is great. Um, I guess, uh, I think that's all the questions directly on a simonib, but uh, perhaps unfairly, I'm gonna um, squeeze another question in here. Given that a simonib perhaps is another treatment um, should you have tried all the other TKIs. Um, where does stem cell transplant fit in with CML these days? Somebody's asked whether it would be an option for them, but in terms of how it fits into the bigger picture, I guess, do you have an opinion on yeah, that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, and I think a simonib may well change that. Um, so my sense, I mean, I've mentioned my couple of patients on panatinib, um, the person who's on panatinib but had the little mini stroke thing recently is is just too old and has too many other conditions to have a transplant safely so that's why they're sticking with it and broadly you know if i've taken somebody through two lines of treatment and i think i'd, I'd put more weight on failing or having the second treatment fail because of a poor response than due to intolerance so if you're on third line treatment because you couldn't tolerate the first two then yeah you're probably going to be fine if you're on third line treatment because drug one and drug two didn't work very well and you didn't have a good response, that's more of a challenge. And I'd be seriously thinking about a bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant in such a patient if other illnesses and age, et cetera, were not contraindications. I think a simonib will change that because now instead of maybe erring towards transplant, I think have a crack at this drug, why not? and see if it does the job. So it gives a choice to avoid a transplant. I'd rather avoid transplants whenever I can because they're quite difficult things uh, with lots of side effects and that can have fatal complications sometimes. So I'm very loath to go towards transplant in general. And I think a simonib might help to fend off the requirement for transplant. So in that respect, it could be very useful. Great, thank you. Did you want to finish your slides, Steve? And then yeah. I've got a couple of other topics. Okay. that we can try and touch on very briefly. Um, so th these are very early um, and very difficult to get your mouth around. So the first one's relatively easy, bodabatinib. There's another drug coming along. And then 
Olverim Batanib. Why do they think of these things? They must go and get drunk in the <laughs> pub and come up with the most ridiculous names possible. Um, so again, when you get the slides, if you're curious about these early phase studies, go and click on these things. I, I'm not sure these things will ever see the light of day in terms of commercially viable medicines that will make it into the health service. Um, mind you, I, I kind of thought that about a simonib a few years ago, and yet here it is. So I'm happy to be proven wrong about that. Um, but it, particularly vodabatinib, it doesn't work against 3 on 5 i So, you know, where's the benefit of that? So these are very early young studies. They're so-called phase 1Bs. So they're just trying to work out the dose and see if they do any, any good. Um, and I think there's still one, and I'm not seeing anything new on it for a while. There was one developed in, I think it's South Korea. I can't remember the name of it, but there are certain countries who have gone on their own to make their own drugs. I think one of those two on screen is, is China-based. I can't remember. Um, so there's still a little bit of, of new, you know, working at the edges to try and improve treatments for CML. But we are blessed, fortunately, with having some fantastic drugs. Uh, which for the vast majority of people work fine. So uh, Asimunib, very handy. We are going to see it this year. These two, we might never see them, but it shows that people are still bashing away to try and improve treatment. So uh, that's all I have to say on those two, Charlotte. Great. I guess that um, has triggered a question in my head in terms of should someone listening today want to go away and dig into all those abstracts that you haven't managed to touch on? Yeah. Do you have any tips for those listening in terms of whether they can tell whether the, <laughs> the study will translate into some sort of change in clinical practice or is that quite a challenging thing to, to get? from someone um, who's maybe not a clinician two, two thoughts about that really um the first is that i think and this is how i've always approached ash for the last 20 years um i, I major on the oral presentations because you know someone has sort of done the work for us in filtering through all of these submissions and the good stuff gets put into an oral presentation and the not so good stuff ends up as posters so um there are two times six, 12 clinical and 12 basic science. So if you want to while away a little bit of time, I'd probably just major on those 12 abstracts. And they're fairly obvious, hopefully, once you get this deck through what they are. Having said that, um, of course, unexpected things appear out of left field all the time, fortunately, so-called black swans. And... Um, there's been one or two things that were, you know, in a poster in the early 2000s, which nobody made much of, that ended up being really quite important. Um, the one thing that comes to mind is that T3 or 5i mutation. You know, that that was somebody who just happened across this. And um, I think it was a poster the first time it was presented in the corner of the room over near the pretzel stand. Um, and, you know, nobody made anything of it. And then it became very clear that it was a very important mechanism of resistance. And then, you know, we've got Asimunib and Panatinib and all these drugs, which were very specifically targeted around that. So I think most of the meat is going to be in the oral presentations, but um, it's fun to just skim through some of the posters and see what's there. That's really interesting. I'm trying to decide what we can cover in the last five minutes. There's so many different interesting questions. Um, but I think I'll touch on this one first. So right back at the beginning of our discussion, we talked about desatinib and 50 milligrams versus 100 milligrams, I think, or two different doses anyway. Um, and then somebody's asked about whether studies have been conducted to assess not just efficacy of different dose levels, but where the right balance lies is that something you think a study could solve or is that a personal thing do you think it's absolutely crucial and in fact it's the first thing a study should solve so um you will have heard me mention phase three studies which are you know comparing new thing with standard thing in lots and lots of patients there's a phase one bit of doing clinical research and a phase two bit and phase one basically asks the question of, is this stuff safe and what's the right dose? So, um, you know, first do no harm is the medical maxim that drives all of this stuff. So 
to answer your question, Jean, it, it is the first thing that is done with all of these things rather than looking at efficacy. And sometimes um, you only get through uh, to the efficacy, so-called phase two stage with a minority of medicines because you find that they're not very well tolerated and not particularly safe in phase one. So um, we have really pretty good evidence about safety. One would certainly hope so before anything gets licensed. The, the difficulty is long-term things. Um, I, you know, I guess, again, we've seen this with COVID, haven't we? You, you get over COVID and you're fine, but then we've heard of long COVID. We're not sure what it is, how you get it, whether it goes away. The Panatinib story was a really illustrative one. Um, you know, everyone thought it was great. It was, it was the, the savior of all our problems, but then it took maybe two, three years for, for it to become clear that there was a real problem. Um, and there's lots of other medicines like that, um, other drugs in medicine, where it takes a while to work out what a problem is. Um, so I think because CML is rare and compared to, you know, arthritis pills or heart pills, there's not many people on them. We've always got to be a little bit wary of long-term data and long-term side effects. Um, but the basic answer is there's a major focus on safety and tolerability at the beginning of drug development for everything. But time often changes that balance slightly as we learn more. Yeah, and I'd be really keen to discuss dose reduction another day in a webinar. I think it's come up quite a lot through this. So thank you everyone for giving me inspiration for future topics of discussion on that front. Um, very last thing I want to touch on, which I forgot to cover back when we were talking about COVID was uh, a couple of people were asking about the vaccination programme and how um, they'd been given a third dose of the jab because they were considered immunosuppressed at the time and since we've learned that's probably not not so much the case but um would you do, do you have any opinion on whether these um people asking should therefore get the fourth dose if they're offered it or is that a quite personal decision you're asking me at the wrong time because i've just, just had covid so uh, if it's someone had offered me a fourth dose i'd have had it so um two thoughts about that really one is um if you look at the original definition of clinically highly vulnerable, pretty much everyone on this call who's got CML would meet those criteria. Um, but as we've discussed today, it, it looks slightly different to the criteria that would get you one of the antivirals that are just coming through. So there's, there's a little bit of a glitch there, but you're going to still be on the list of highly vulnerable. So probably at some point, someone's going to you know, ring up and or email whatever text and offer you a fourth jab um so go for it if someone offers you to you we haven't got time to talk about you know the downsides of jabs and that's played out in the news constantly but if it was me i'd take it with open arms um the second thing to say is i and again from personal experience i just wonder what the point of me having those three jabs was because i probably got omicron and maybe my jabs haven't helped me well they probably stopped me getting something else last year but I think the fourth jab and constantly now we're refining, the companies are refining the specificity of the jabs to make them more specific to the current, the prevalent variant. So it could be that the three you've had wouldn't have done anything good to something that you might come across in Sainsbury's this afternoon as you go shopping. So uh, yes, I think you'll probably get offered it. And yes, I think you should take it. Great. Thank you, Steve, for clarifying that with one minute to go, which should give me just enough time to, to go through my slides. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. And yeah, everybody um, is a showering praise on, on you. And that. I would agree. It's been really, really interesting to, um, to talk about not just um, their treatments and things, but also how some of the ASH data has actually directly affected some of those COVID bits and bobs that we that, that, that are going on right now. Um, which is a, a rare occasion of seeing a direct and very quick translation of, of science into policy, one that we're all very grateful for. And it'll be interesting, Charlotte, in, if people want to feedback. I mean, we've done this in a slightly different way today. Yeah. Um, and people might not like it, and they might wish to have it done in a different way. But I, I'm very curious to know if this has been a useful way of doing things um, and what people think about that. And also, I'll send you the slides so you can distribute them or post them as you wish. Um, and just try and make this as useful as we can for people in the future if we do it again. Absolutely, yes. Um, you'll all be uh, receiving a 
um, feedback form, which would be really, really helpful for you to fill in. I know some of you have been to webinars in the past and already filled them out, but I think, as Steve said, we've tried something a bit different today. Uh, someone's already said they liked it, which is very kind of you. Um, but yeah, please do uh, give us your thoughts so we can um, learn for the future on these webinars. Right, okay, so just a quick overview of um, some other things we've got going on at Leukemia Care. Um, in terms of webinars, we're currently focusing on um, ASH for um, for this week in terms of, of how the conference has um, affected different uh, types of leukemias, um, but we have, are currently planning webinars for the rest of the year, so do keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. Um, and obviously we've got lots of other ways of learning more about um, leukemia um, on our website and our podcast and our magazine is due to hit um hit the shelves i was going to say but we don't sell it. <laughs> hit your door mats probably a better way of saying it um uh, very shortly for the first quarter so do look out for that just a reminder we've got lots of information generally on cml uh, in our booklets uh, which you can download at the link on the screen now next slide please um, a quick reminder of all our support services here from professional support, such as counselling, all the way um, down to sort of peer to peer support through our support groups and buddy service. So whatever you're looking for, do get in touch. Next slide, please. Um, we did want to take the opportunity to remind you of our national support group meetings, which are also run on Zoom. Um, but uh, you're on screen and, and can speak, which is a, a a, a slightly different format which you might find more useful to share experience directly with other um, patients and people affected by leukemia so here's just a couple of the cml ones we've got coming up soon where you can discuss different topics depending on where you are in your um, treatment pathway or journey or whatever word you like to use to describe the process you've been through since diagnosis uh, next slide please and I wanted to remind you, um, particularly of our advocacy caseworker, because um, I know we talked a little bit about treatments today, and I know that's one of the more, more challenging times in which you're asked to make decisions and weigh at risks and benefits. And um, our advocacy caseworker is the best person to chat to uh, on that front. We'd be more than happy just to spend an hour or so just weighing up options alongside you. That's what we're here for. So please do reach out um, if you do need any support on that or any other topic at all. Next slide, please. A um, couple of fundraising opportunities should you want to help support our webinars and other activities we do in the future. We're bringing Step Out for Spot Leukemia back, which is a nice challenge because you can do as much or as little in terms of the goal as you like, which I know can be really, really helpful for those of you who are living with um, side effects and fatigue and, and things like that. So do check that one out. Next slide, please. Or if you're a little bit more crazy and want to go really hard, uh, we've got the London Landmarks Marathon, which is a half marathon, I believe, um, which is being held in April. Um, so do have a look and, and sign up. So that one's free to enter, which uh, obviously the, the London Marathon and other running events are. Um, yeah, and if you want to find out more about us, we also have social media as well, which some of you will be watching us on Facebook. Next slide, please. And do get in touch for calling us or dropping us an email if you need anything else at all. As Steve said, we will make sure to send around the slides um, alongside the feedback forms. And we always make the recording of our webinars available on YouTube for you to refer back to alongside those slides. Thank you again, everyone, for listening. Thank you again, Steve, for your time for a really, um, really interesting analysis of, of that meeting. And um, we'll hopefully see you all again at the webinar soon. Thanks Have a good evening. All. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.